Hello and welcome. Tonight is the demo for Odin, another compiler demo. And today is to kind of be talking about what has happened in version 1.0. So, oops, just close everything while I'm there. <laughs> Shall we just restart that? <clears throat> So today we are going to be talking about new features I've added into Odin, um, especially some of the things I've changed, removed, and even fixed. Um, but if you don't know what you're talking about, you just kind of come to the stream randomly, or even this video if it's pre-recorded. Um, Odin is my, a new language I've been developing, and a few other people as well, just helping along, uh, which is a kind of a replacement for my needs at least, replace C, with a few special goals. Again, simplicity, high performance, uh, built for modern systems, uh, joy programming, metaprogramming in some senses, and designed for good programmers. Uh, many of these are... <coughs> Same kind of goals what Jonathan Blow was doing for his game, uh, language JAI, which he, but he wants to for his developing games. I want mine for mainly just systems programming in general. Um, so I've done many talks on this before, many demos, so please watch them behind. They're all on the internet. Fine, we're here. Some of the demonstrations I haven't talked about before. This one will be on there next. So if you want to try out the latest version of this compiler, it only, again, only works on 64-bit Windows at the moment. Uh, yes, you'll most likely find bugs. But please report them and issue them in the issues. To get the latest one, please go to the releases and download the um, Odin version 0.1.3. Uh, this will be all in here. This will tell you what's added in this version. There's later older versions below, telling all the more information for that specific release. There's my actual GitHub page. You don't need to Odin. Um, and please also read read me. It tells you extra information in there as well. So let's go on to the demo. So some of the things I've added and, and minor things here that I'm not just going to delve off. So. I've added unexported entities and fields which are allowed to do in an underscore prefix. So it says, I'm telling myself, please go see sync.odin. So if we go to the sync.odin file, you'll now notice all of this. <clears throat> so these will be st structures here. This is a semaphore with a handle. These are a mutex with a semaphore counter owner recursion factor in there. So the underscore now states that these parameters, these fields in these structs, are private to this file scope. So you can create f things in here, which are all um, values in here, so you can say you can still use it within this file. But once you use this like, file this or this library externally, none of these values will be used to the user. So it's kind of like private in C++. But instead of being private to and only be usable on the members of that kind of thing, it is mainly a... Um, thing related to just this kind of file in general, this library. Um, this is again very useful if you want something kind of opaque, like a mutex. You don't really want the users to touch any of this data. You just want to treat this as this as the type. It's opaque in itself. Um, I know I'm not particularly sure with the force prefix going on here. Um, it's just the same thing going on. It's just it's the best convention I had without having to add more keywords. Uh, the other reason is this also applies to procedures as well. So you can have a procedure which is limited to, or restricted to this function as well. So if you prefix this procedure with an underscore, this procedure will only work within this file, unless you do something else, but that's just X rules. Um, so this would be local to this file, it's private to this file, just with the underscore prefix. I could have a keyword, but I don't know, the shortness and the niceness of just an underscore is quite nice. But again, it's a minor thing. I've also, the one thing, the big thing since last time is I've removed maybe or option types, as many people call them. Uh, the main reason is that in a language such as Odin, which is quite low level, um, they do not really provide any extra safety benefits, especially because you can just do loads of unsafe stuff in this language. Um, and also, they are not that beneficial either. Many people don't understand, it was struggling hard, and many people understand how they work. And it, the benefits that they gain are, aren't really beneficial in this language in particular. So, that's one minor thing here. Uh, 
Uh, Ratchet Freak is now explaining, yes, the underscore thing kind of like D. Uh, I didn't borrow it from D, I just thought it would be quite nice to have. It's in similar to Go, so yeah, and it's similar to D, but it, it's in many other languages have it as well. So other things I've removed, I've removed the keyword type and a few of the reserved keywords now. I've been trying to cut down on the keywords in this language to begin with. So type is not a keyword, it's just a normal identifier. But its purpose for like define, being explicit about a type, later on you'll see later, um, it's now got a hash and then the keyword type. So like these aren't keywords, these are just hash and directives. Um, it, that's what type is now as well. The other things I've removed is the dot dot less than and dot 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 and I've replaced both of their uses with just a dot dot. So in the case where you're using it for any um, in variadic parameters it's now just a dot dot instead of a dot 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 and in cases when you want a half close range use this. There is now no fully open range. Um, it's just I kind of gone the rust route. Um, I'm not really still not sure which one I want. <laughs> fewer features. Right, some things have changed again. Um, compile assert and this, compile assert and assert now return a value, which is about the literally the condition of the value. This is for, for semantic reasons, so you can do. Um, whoops, I keep I keep getting my hands in the wrong place. <laughs> so you can keep um, returning this as you can use these as values and store them at compile time. So you don't have to have procedures stored elsewhere. Uh, thread local is again not a keyword anymore, it's just it's a hash thing. I've changed include to be load, just to stop um, confusion. So it's not, get people don't use to get import and include, no, it's, it's import and load. Uh, one of the good things now, which is files only get checked if they are actually used. So this means you don't have um, compile time asserts flaring off if you actually don't even need it. Um, match in uses now got a keyword for in, which we'll explain later. Uh, this is instead of having match type, it's now match in. Uh, version numberings have changed as well, as you may have noticed. We have now gone to version 0.1.0. Finally, we're not we're not using the old notation, which was dreadful. We're now using the major minor patch version. Uh, minors in this case are still minor, um, and I haven't really followed the patch thing yet. I just I kind of kept adding things to this minor version um, before releasing it, so I'll, I'll keep back to this sanity. I apologise if it's clipping and popping at times. Um, this is probably the, just the positioning of the actual mic. Um, is there a? I don't think it's cutting off at all. No, it's just me. So that's one thing. And then also, I'm going to talk about is the core library additions to the Windows specific stuff as well. There's minor changes there. So we're going to first talk. The most simplest one of here is enums. This is the first simple feature is that on the type the enum there is now a slice called names which you can get the names of all the enums for that thing. You can do this manually with the type information but this is a nice quick thing in the language. So if I build the very first line is here apple banana coconut. Great it works. The next thing which is a very big feature that many people want um, I know it's, if you want to lower that this is very useful to have is you can do the specific alignment of a type. So here's a normal one, which should just be a struct A, I'm calling this, it should be X and Y. Um, and by default, this alignment would be 4, because the size of this element is 4, so the alignment of this struct would be 4. Um, the biggest alignment will be 4, so that's how it kind of works in this language. But I can be ex explicit and say, no, the alignment of this, I want this to be 16 bytes. Ignore whatever's in here, just say it's 16 bytes. And it will be fine. If this alignment gets very large, so let's say 64, um, I flag a warning says custom alignment has been clamped to oh, two, six, no, from 16 to from 264. I've got this bug already, and I've found a bug. <laughs> it's only a cosmetic bug, um, mainly because um, the maximum alignment on this system is 16 bytes to begin with. If you need extra, you probably need to allocate it. Um, I'll probably fix that as well. Um, I need. There's loads of other things I need to fix. It's I haven't decided all these features yet. The music, one of the main reasons why is this is because I'm using um, LLVM as a backend. But that's fine. Again, I've also sort of I've removed the... Going on to the next section now. Slow down. One of the things I've done now is I've removed the dot dot colon and the dot 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 and just replaced it with the dot dot. So in this case, for 4 i in 0 to 16, this is similar if I wrote this. So this variable is immutable, it's just a value, 
So this would be equivalent, in a sense, what's going on. It's not equivalent, but because this technically, it's close enough. It's just close enough. Um, one of the new features I've added, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, again, the syntax is probably not final, but I very much like this. Is labelled statements. So you can have, say, okay, here's a for loop. We're going to go increment here. And then we're going to increment this one here, another nested in here. For this one here, I want to continue from this top loop here, at loop here. Before, if I was going to do that, in my language, you'd have to do a set of variable uh, to flag it and do all that and stuff. With this, I just say, nope, I just go back to that branch and continue again. So I can actually do a specific label. This is very, very useful. And for me, it removes most of the problems I have, or the solutions I've needed for go to. This allows me to break out of this nested for structure with just a break, or break out of um, a match statement that I want to do, or a certain thing that's nested. Again, these la this label parameter works for for loops, for in loops, match, and match in loops um, statements. So that's one of the things I've quite enjoyed having in this language. And it's very handy to have, yes. Um, it's Again, it solves virtually all the problems I have with GoTo, especially Defer as well. I don't really need GoTo anymore if I have these two features. Um, again, just, I'm just thinking from a practical side. So one of the other things I'm going to do now is with the match in stuff. So instead of it being match type before, it's now match in. Again, it's just a minor syntactical difference. But one thing I'm allowing now is you can have multiple cases on here. So the syntax is a little bit, the, how it works is a bit different. So we're going to say get the type info of int. So storing this t uh, variable t, we use using type info, so we don't have to do prefix everything here. And we're going to match i in t. Simple enough. And in this case, we're now going to, if it this either goes to integer or a float, it'll be called. Now the value of i in this case will not be one of these. It'll just be of type info. If it was just info, one of these in here. Um, you'll notice that it will actually gather the type of integer. This is what a union will do. It'll you get the subtype. But when you have two or zero in the case, it'll just have the t this i value have the type of that. So that is pretty damn useful to have. And again, shown again, the label thing works again with break. So if I want to say break out of this case, this match statement, you can. You can see what goes on here. Um, this says it's a number, and this one says it's an int or an F32. So again, it works, multiple cases work for an any as well. So if you put an actual specific type in. Okay, let's go to the next. Just go to then one another cool little feature of adding in. These are just minor sanity things I'm just adding in again as well. So in many like times, you have got a condition. And you want a value and you want to set something with a condition. And you just want to do it short and sweet. Um, yes, this is usually clearer. So here's my condition. Here's my value I want to set. If the condition is true, set this. Else, set is that. This can be mildly error prone, um, and also it is quite verbose. I've had to take up seven lines. I've now introduced the ternary operator, and now you've only taken one line, and it's actually maybe not as clear what you're doing, but it's much more terse. And in many cases, I would argue it is. But one good thing about this turning operator is it actually does work with the constant system. So the constant system would mean this is now a constant value. You can pass it around. This is not stored in memory at all. It's just in the compiler. And it's great. So now this is you can use this in any of your logic in the compiler, like the constant system. So you may want to set a value to be constant on a certain um, architecture or something, or whatever, or if um, some condition is with your constant system, whatever. You, it's just basic logic. So you've now got kind of a um, basic Turing machine in this compute in this language. And basically, well, not really Turing machine. It's more of a. It's a you can do basic logic. You can do if uh, if and true and else and adding and subtracting and whatever. I bet someone's going to take advantage of this now, aren't they? Um, <laughs> try and make their own bleeming thing inside the, just the constant system. So now let's go on to another feature I've kind of implemented. So slices now store a capacity. So before they were just a pointer to the data, a count. 
now they have a capacity. I originally had this ages ago, but I've I got removed it and now I've added it back. Um, there's a reason why I've added this back. You'll see the new feature I've added and it'd be pretty useful to see. So let's start off with a buffer. This is just a, an array. So I store this on the stack um, and that means you've got 256 bytes stored on the stack in this buffer. And then I'm going to create a slice, which is again, stores a pointer, count, and a capacity. So in this slice of the byte slices, um, I am going to store, a, I'm going to slice this a buffer. So I'm going to say, hey, start from zero. So start from nothing and go to the count of zero. Now this will automatically put a capacity value in there. And this could be the same as me writing this, but that is an optional value. That's what it does. So it takes all the store all the capacity in here in this buffer here, but set the zero, count to zero. So if you say the count here, it says count equals zero, but the capacity equals two five six. That's great. Now I can use the append function to this slice, and I can append one, two, and three to it if I wanted to. So now if I print the slice, I get one, two, and three. So now the count's gone up by three, but the capacity is still the same. So now slices are a very brilliant way of using as a buffer type is the best way of thinking about them so if you just need a fixed sized buffer slices are what you want so now let's look at another slice here we're going to take a sub slice of this slice we're going to start from index one and go up to index two but then set the capacity to be up to index three so this now means that the count in this case is one so two minus one is one, but the capacity is two. So with three, which is the third index minus one, will be two. So this means that there's only going to be the value two being produced. And hey, presto, that's what's happened. That's great. And the other thing you can do is another little function here is called clear. Uh, this works on other things, which we'll see later. Um, but again, all this pretty much is equivalent to is setting the count to zero. You can even do this manually if you want to be a bit more ex explicit, but they both work the same. So that slices for you again. Now I'm going to explain a little bit more of a little handy feature to have. This is um, useful if you want to be working with data a lot. Say you have an array of things here, which is, this is my foo array. Um, I want to store this in a file and my file functions only allow me to take a slice of bytes. Um, so I just have a built-in procedure called slice to bytes. This will take your slice and turn it into a bunch of bytes. Like that's all it does. So again, this is very useful if you want to write something to the OS, like os.write the handle and then fill with bytes. Um, but if you want to go from bytes to the uh, slice of foo, now you're gonna have to do it the long way. Um, so I have a built-in procedure called slice pointer, which will take in, um, it takes in a data pointer and a count and an optional capacity. If there is no capacity, it will use the count value. Now, this is kind of what I've had to do. And it's, yes, it's manual. I could probably put a built-in one if I wanted, but even though this may be more error prone, I think it's more clearer and more what's going on. But if I did have it, what would have to be the syntax? Would you do this, something else? I don't know. <coughs> So let's go on to the next thing. Uh, the next thing I was going to talk about are vectors. <coughs> now vectors in this language, I have changed the memory layout of them. Um, so a vector three in this case is now a completely different memory layout to many of the other things. So if I go to, um, it's here. They have a very similar memory layout to an array now. Even a vector of booleans is a similar memory layout to an array. Before it was, um, they were bit packed, and this is because of LLVM. I am now ignoring LLVM's rule and doing it manually because LLVM is great, not. And even LLVM wasn't even consistent in this case. Sorry, I'm hating on LLVM, but I'll get to the good news later. So we can just say these two vectors here. Um, you can do all the comparisons on a vector and all the operations here, and you can just see them or how they work. So you can see that they are element wise and such. So this is um, true, true, true. So each of these values is less than the second one. Um, if you add them together, element-wise, it's fine. If you take away them, element-wise, it's fine. Multiply them, element-wise, yep. Divide by them, element-wise, yeah. Um, a nice little feature now with vectors is you can actually print them. So you can go through um, 
every single value in this vector element and actually print them. This is now because this is allowed because these vectors are uh, kind of laid out as an array in memory. So this wasn't possible before. Now you can do this. Um, that's good. The other thing I've also done is you'll notice that the size of a, a vector of balls is going to be the size of an array of balls. Again, it's the layout in the memory. The difference is their alignment won't be the same. So the alignment of vector 7 of an i32 will not be the same as the alignment of an array of i32. This is because an array, an alignment, will be the elements type of that thing, while in a vector it will be the entirety. There's some special rules and this is just mainly platform specific. So sorry about that, but that is mainly because these vectors are meant to map um, to actual hardware vectors on your on your machines. Okay, so some of the the fumped changes. Um, this is where uh, Mikkel or this trunk dame might, uh, is talking about. Almost says it was all broken. It might have bugs in it, but it's just changed the semantics. So. B printf returns an int. This is the amount of bytes that will be written. And S printf is now returning a string. So let's look at what S printf does first. With S printf, you just pass it a slight byte, uh, like a byte slice. And this is what you'll keep appending to. And it will return a string of the new, of the new thing that you've returned to. So if you say, hello, um, one, two, three, others, exclamation mark, here we go. I'm just going to make this a little bit different just to show you. Um, there we go. It says, hello, one, two, three, others, exclamation mark, hello, three, two, one, y'all, um, exclamation mark. Good. So the B printf is slightly different. See, what you do is you pass a pointer to a buffer, and this buffer gets changed as you write it, and it will return the count. So if you need to get the string back, you have to do this manually. So sprintf kind of does this internally, but instead of passing a pointer to a buffer, you just uh, slice, you just pass a slice. Again, I may change this in the future. This is just a library feature, so please don't worry. I'm not that bothered with libraries at the moment. I'm more worried about the actual language. Libraries are a different problem to solve rather than the actual language. So let's now go to the fancy stuff. We're going to get to the fancy stuff, finally. I have now introduced a dynamic array. So notice this array, instead of it having a count or vector in there, it says dynamic. So what this means is this array now stores a pointer, a count, a capacity, and an allocator. So it will use whatever the current context allocator is. So I've talked about allocators in a previous video. Um, you can find this in whatever you want. But what this now does is now I can use a kind of a stretchy buffer. This is what my dynamic array is. I can manually say, hey, okay, I want to reserve 16 elements. Manually, okay. And I can also say defer free. So this free is now overloaded to accept numerous different types. So pointers, slices, strings, dynamic arrays, and the special type that's coming soon. So it's very good. So you're now also going to append to it like anything else. I've also imagined this is a minor feature here. So number literals can have underscores in them. This is mainly for readability. If you wanted it, this is not a feature. I'm just was kind of advertising a lot because it is minor, but it's very useful to have. And again, these as append is very arctic as well. So you can just keep adding pending. Um, so I can also print this array. So I can go each element in this array. So P will be the whatever the value is, i is the index, and then if you print off here, you can see there's the value I've just printed off. So just to prove that's the case, uh, change that to 1, 2, 3, uh, there you go, printing it out, great. Now, this is a little bit uh, uh, verbose for what I may be needing, maybe very clear what's going on, but I can just do this. I can actually do a dynamic array literal so this will still use the um, context allocator, whatever that may be um, at the time, maybe the, just the default allocator. And you just create a literal, so it'll just assign that there. And you can just sign it there. It's got like an array literal, but in this case, yeah, a dynamic one. I can just even just do print line or whatever the print function is, just to print it, and it will print it just like anything else. I can pass this clear function that I did for slices, so it'll set the capacity to zero. 
no, the, the count to zero, but they keep the same capacity. And then, you see, there's nothing wrapped up left. Now on to the next fancy feature. Um, you may be wondering why I've added these types. I'll explain this at the end. So, sorry if I'm just going on. Right, the next fancy feature is a hash table. Um, in this, I've kind of copied this idea from Go, um, in the, the syntax mainly. Um, so this is, I call it a map. So this is mapping from one a key to a value. And again, that's what a hash, um, hash table does. I can do the same kind of thing. I can reserve it, so I can reserve 16 slots. And then I can free it when I'm done with. So with a map, because it's now built into the language, you can have this lovely syntax. So, hey, okay, at this index, this key, uh, 1.0 for this float, so the key's perfectly fine for a float in this case. I want to say, okay, I'm going to set that value to be 1278. You can do it again for this key and this key. If you want to check if a value exists, you have to do this um, value OK expression. This is like an optional OK expression. So this is, says, OK, this is just exists. This one doesn't care if it exists. This one just says, get me the value. If it doesn't exist, just give me the default value, so the zero value for that value type. That's all that does. And I'm asserting here that, OK, these two do the same operation. So it's, it's found, and the value is what I put in. Great. So if we want to manually print it out, we can just do print the value here, the map, and I put it in, to, in it, an index value here, as you'll see. So for the for loop, I've got the value of that thing and the key as well of the map. So as I go through, I um, print each value, the key and the value. And you can see here, I've got map and it's printing all the values in. These might be in any random order. It's not ordered. It's an unordered hash table. That's all it is. So that's it. Um, so we scroll down again. Now there's our map lib tools as well. These are dynamic maps. Again, I should have stated this. Uh, you can do the same thing. It's game with the same with the uh, dynamic arrays. This is a dynamic map literal, just to keep things simple. In this case, I'm now using a string as the key rather than a float. So I'm allowing integers, strings, floats, and I think that's about it. I think that's all I'm accepting. Um, if you need a specific one, you can supply your own hashing thing. So you just supply like a U64 as the key, supply your own, supply your own um, hashing function for your specific type. Um, I wanted to keep it simple for most things. So that's kind of what it does. So you can search for the key and it'll do that. That's great. You can also delete an entry from a key. So you, you first specify the map and then you specify the key. So now this states that if I delete it, you will not be able to find it. That's what this thing does here. So instead of getting the value, this will be the zero value in this case. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to sort of assert that, hey, it's not found. Great. So if I print the map now, you'll notice I've removed C. Um, it goes A, B, C, and I remove C. It only sees left. If I use the clear function here, all I'm doing is saying, OK, just remove all the values, but still keep the capacity of the actual um, thing, so you can still add to it. Hey, the map disappeared. Um, fixed size maps are planned in the language, so these can be set on the, like the stack if you wanted to, or in a fixed memory. But I haven't implemented them yet, and there's many reasons, just like technical reasons, why I haven't implemented them. And also, I haven't actually needed them yet. I keep getting the pressing the wrong button. <laughs> um, so I haven't really needed them yet. That's okay. So let's go on to the next thing. Just talk about our unions. So these are a new feature as well. There are so many new features I'm talking about, which I've added for this new 1 point, or 0 0.1 at least. So this is a new how uh, tag unions work. So the syntax for tag unions has slightly changed. Actually, not, it's drastically changed, in fact. So I'm just divide two types. This would be a common thing you'd see in a game. So a tagged union or a discriminated union or variants, whatever, they're all slightly different names, but they all pretty much have the similar meaning. So let's define vector three, which is very common in most maths. Uh, it probably won't look like this. You'll be probably using the vectors built into the language, but whatever. You have a quaternion as well um, and use that. So here is an entity maybe in your game. 
if you made a game. Um, so you may have some common fields for every single entity. So you may have an ID, which is U64, a name, a position, an orientation, some flags, whatever. They're the common fields. But you may have some variants or like subtype entities for this entity. So you may have like a frog with some specific data in it. You may have a door with some specific data. You might have a map, whatever. These have specific data to it. However, what's special about a union is, is that each of these entities all take up the same memory. They are just an entity. They take up the same amount of data. That's what's special about a tagged union. So if we look at an entity here, we just saw again how tagged unions work. I've explained before, but the syntax is now changed, as you can see. I can um, implicitly convert this variant, the entity.frog, to entity. And I can even use some of the common fields. So a frog will have ID like ever, but it will have its specific values here. So you can just implicitly convert to it. I can also ex access the common fields on any entity, so not a specific variant or anything, um, and just set them normally. So if I go into a match in statement and pass this um, union in now to get the specific types, you'll notice it goes, it should be frog and it says ribbit. So, yep, for frog. Great. Um, but if you don't want to have to do all of this the long way with a match statement, you may want to just test it with a union statement like this. Um, this is similar, again, syntax to the map. This is an optional OK. You can get the default value, or the value, whatever it's going to be, and an OK. You can test to see if it's OK, and then yes. So it says here the frog jumps F... Uh, whatever feet high at what I see here the jump the frog jumps um, a hundred uh, two point one feet high um, at this position here one four nine great now if you want to do something slightly like um, unsafe or something you maybe want to do an, an, a union cast here this will not check this this will not um, you won't do a manual check or do an automatic check and if it's not that type it will panic. Um, that we have flagged like it's like an assertion in C, but this in my language it's sort of panic and say, look, you cannot cast this type at runtime to this value here. Um, so I'm going to panic for you. You can ignore the, the thing and want to ignore the error and it will force the cast to that variant. So you just have to ignore the value or just don't handle it. So that is mainly all the new features in this language that I've added and many some of the fixes. So look at all that. So thank you for listening, and right, would like anyone got any questions? So, uh, questions, I'll just wait a minute or two so they can compile it was. Right, so we've um, got a few questions here. There's some I'm just going to go through the backlog. Um, what are the questions? Is someone's asking? Does Odin's map and implement using chaining? Uh, yeah, most maps kind of have to. So if you have a map collision, you have to somehow handle that. And I am. Um, if you look in the preload, oh, this is big. Um, you can see how a map internally works. So this is all the type information which is used in the tag unions, which I absolutely love. Um, I absolutely like tag unions most of the time. I've talked about this before. Where is how a map works? It's all the way down here. These are all like built-in types. Here's, here's a dynamic map. So you have a dynamic array of hashes, and you also have a dynamic array of the entries, which is a, a raw dynamic array. 
Um, it, it does a lot of fancy tricks and it's just, it is just a pretty much way of doing it generics, generically without I'm implementing generics. Um, but yeah, so you can see the entry for a map. Uh, do, 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 does it, here we go. So for an entry for a map, this will be the head of the map which has other information. Um, so it's kind of like a, a bundle of data. But the entry will have a key, the next value, and then the value stored at the data. So this is just the header. So the next value is, hey, is this the key that you wanted? No, go to the next value. And just, it just it's, So it chains, yeah. Um, I haven't benchmarked this yet. I'm not bothered about the performance. I can always change the internals yet. I just wanted the feeling of the language to go right. Um, this drunk Dane is asking, didn't you want no implicit conversions in your language? Um, I wanted limited implicit conversions in this language. So I do allow things to implicitly, all pointers to implicitly cast to raw pointer, um, because I find that's very, very useful to have. Um, and especially, I think also you should be able to get the variant type implicitly cast to its like general type. Um, again, it's many of this is sanity reasons. But in general, most there are virtually no implicit conversions at all in the language. Those are just minor things. Um, Miblo is asking, can you nest ternary tests? Yes, you can have um, a ternary value in a ternary value and that, keep doing that way. I wouldn't recommend it, but you are allowed to do it. Um, how do you supply your own hashing function to maps? So this is the, okay, this is a um, bill style hashing functions. So I'm just going to go to here and explain. And this is how I do it in C already. Um, I, I supply a hashing key. So you could have a specific one like this and you'd have a key like a U64 and then you have your value type here. So this would be a map, whatever, like that, yeah? So then you would just pass this, um, this is the hashing proc, and then this is your data, whatever your data may be. Um, and then you set the value data, whatever. So you supply it like every time. So it calculates every time, you just supply whatever your data is. So it's a little less type safe, but if you're doing this and you want a, a weird value, like you want specific data, this is probably a better way of doing it anyway. This is the way I do it in C. If you even, this entirety of how I do everything in C, I have a generic hash key, but the value is specific to whatever it needs to be. So the value is type safe, it's just the key isn't. Um, if you again, if you look at the preload, you can see how I actually have the, st the key is stored. The key has got a hash value, which is U64, or a string if it is a string. Um, this is to um, cheat. The string is there so you can get the string back. Um, so when you go through the um, when you're going through like a for loop, you want to be able to get the string back. Like you want to be able to print it. You don't want to just store it as a hash and never know what it was originally. So yeah, that's a cheat. But yes. Um, the reason why I don't pass you a procedure for the hashing function is because when you pass like a, an integer or a float, you don't actually do any hashing to it whatsoever. I just store that as a bytes in the thing. So there's no real need to hash those values. The only time I actually use a hashing function is for a string. But again, it's it's very complicated. And again, this is probably another topic I was going to talk about later. Um, it's just a general thing. Um, you're getting on at here. Question is again, um, where do you stand on the attribute data thing? Um, again, I actually think it's probably okay supplying extra information for the user um, with extra things. I know what you want again, Michael, um, but um, again, I've been trying to do other things. I'm going to talk about where we're going next with the language just after these questions, so don't worry about that. Um, yes, ints could be very poorly distributed, you're correct, and um, that's where the chaining would go wrong. But hashing those ints is probably not going to be better any either way. It's, if you, it's again, it's a, I'll have to do the um, implementation better. It's one of those things that I wanted the feature in here anyway. Um, I find that, I'm now going to go to the second part, sorry, this is me going on next existential talk 
But I haven't explained why I've even added dynamic arrays and dynamic maps into the language in the first place. The main reason I've kind of done this is I've came to the same conclusion as Go, which is that for 99% of the time, with 99.9% .9 of the time, the only generic types that I need that are dynamic are dynamic arrays and dynamic hash tables. Everything else I will write manually, and it's quicker to do so. It's very, very, very rare I need anything else that's generic. Um, and that's what I found in my personal needs. In fact, my entire compiler, the only things I need, which would, you know, would a, a stretchy buffer, a dynamic array, and a dynamic map, a hash table. They're the things I've found that to be very useful. And Go has done this as well. I've kind of just came to the same conclusion as Joe. Go. It's not um, something I've kind of just copied. I've just it came to that conclusion. Um, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean I don't want a form of generics. This is where the problem is. I've been trying to th figure out ways of implementing it, and I just haven't come across a way I actually quite like. Um, it's really, really difficult to decide. Um, I haven't really found a language I like either that does it well. But again, this is those were the problems. Um, there are stuff where in Go, um, there was a article I was reading about someone who was writing this um, this piece of software, there's not one person but loads of people, they're writing this piece of software that's about half a million lines of Go and it's for some, it's for deploying software on cloud net, on cloud servers and stuff like that. It's, it's not what I need but it's probably someone does need it. Um, and they they use Go and it's fine, it's the best tool they've used and they noticed in the time they're writing 500,000 lines they only wanted generics twice. Twice they found that they actually wanted generics most of the time Go's feature set actually solved most of their problems. Um, so, and I think that the two times they wanted, there were just specific cases, so they just wrote it out again. Yes, it's probably not the best option, and that is probably one minor problem. But in that amount of time, if they only needed it twice, or wanted it twice at least, it shows you you don't actually need it that often. I found that, again, if you have some basic generic Nissness, um, you'll be fine. Um, so let's take my way back from that. So the way that kind of Go compensates with the lack of generics is that um, Go has interfaces. So they have the types and methods on these types, and you have interfaces which go to that type. So that's one kind of nice little thing why it can work. There are other languages, um, such as Rust, which have traits, which are similar to these interfaces, but they're a bit more explicit. Interfaces in Go are very implicit. Um, and again, in most cases, these solve a lot of problems. The problems that I don't want to implement, I'd, I didn't want to actually implement any of like these traits or interfaces into language. Uh, the, one of the main reasons behind this is I couldn't think of a decent way without implementing uh, methods, and I don't want to go down that route, because if, again, if you add a method, you have to use go down this interface route or whatever, and it's, I don't see the the big benefit. Again, it's just, at the moment, I don't really see it. I like standalone procedures on their own, they're useful, having the using factor in there is pretty damn good as well. It doesn't really, having methods doesn't really solve any extra problem, except this relationship thing, which is a very object-oriented style of thinking. Not a very problem-solves prop thinking, but again, I'm still open to the decision if I can find a good way of doing it. The other ways is you could have standalone procedures on their own and still have this kind of trait bundle idea. But the problem with that is then you the way to get it working well is that you're going to have to cock up um, scope rules. If you want it in an implicit way, you're going to cock up scope rules. If you want it in a very explicit way, then it's probably not going to work. It's, just, it's really complicated. It's topic language design. It's really interesting that program language design is. It's just... Just adding features isn't going to fix problems. You are trying to fix actual problems, and you're trying to find the things you actually want. 
And again, generics or paramount polymorphism, whatever you call it, is a really complicated topic to begin with, and it's not easy to solve. So I hope that understands some of my concerns. Um, is there any other questions people have got in the audience or as such? Um, I'm just now just trying to stop on that topic there. So I hope you understand kind of where this language is going. So the plan for version 0.2 is something crazy. Uh, Kalimian in the background is probably going to be saying this is... Um, this is probably help, helping me on this one. Is I'm hoping touch wood, to try and replace the back end of this compiler. So replace LLVM, or have LLVM as a set and an option, and have our own custom back end. So this language will now have our own SSA back end, and this will go down to machine code. I think to begin with, I may not go down to machine code, but I want this SSA to also be executable. So, like, inter interpretable, sorry. So it's... It's kind of like, um, so I want to be, oh, sorry, I know, I know what my thoughts gone then. I want this to be executable, so like as an interpreter bytecode. So that means I can actually run, have, have a compile time execution code. So I have a basic metaprogramming system built in. So it's a, it's a two for system. It's a two for one thing. I get uh, metaprogramming and I also get a backend, which should be faster than the LLVM one, even though it may not be as good, the, back, the um, generated code, it'll be so much faster to do. So I hope that has uh, explained many things what I've done, um, and I hope you can see where we're going to go next with the language, especially with the new custom backend. Um, I've gotten to the point where there's most of the features in the language I want personally are there and done. Um, but again, I will be asking for help from people. I'm, I'm asking loads of people. I'm asking, again, if you want to help and contribute on this project, please do. Please just go to um, github.com forward slash gingerbill slash odin for the actual code and some of the, and the releases. But if you want to help, help out elsewhere um, and ask questions or even discuss things, please go to odin.handmade.network for the blog and the forums where many of the nice, kind people we talked about many things to do with Odin, um, also like program language design as well. And thank you all for watching. So I'm just going to stop the recording now, and if you want to continue the conversation now on the stream, you can do.